after interviewing about 30 odd studios, um, we're here. I've got so many comments on YouTube of people asking me to, to cause I, I talk about my studio when we do tours. So a lot of people have asked me to do a tour of my own studio and I've been meaning to do it for so long, but there was like a lot of things um, that were kind of holding the process up, but here we are today and I'm excited to kind of show you some cool things and how I work and the different things that I use. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about this room that we're in and I'll get Jay to show you the trap door on camera later. But um, basically this is the third floor of a um, 150 year old house in Canada. And it was originally, this was like a, kind of like a, a heavy duty oak tongue and groove that was on top of like a few inches on uh, off of uh, the plywood and then the shingles. So the original... The floor is still original and the trap door is somewhat original, like the hole is original. And um, so it used to be super hot. So when we first moved in here, it was uh, never really planned to be a studio just because it was so hot and in the winter it was so cold and there was bats and it was very dark. There was only one outlet, no lights. Um, but I ended up moving up here and working out of here for a couple of years. And then we decided to do the reno. So the reno is, and I'll post some pictures of the reno, but basically we gutted all of the original um, wood that was on the walls, which was, it was pretty, it was nice wood, but it was painted blue and was really uh, rough shape. Threw it all out the window into a bin. And there was no insulation. There was just like dust and uh, there was no critters, but there was evidence of critters. And then um, we had new windows installed. We had this, the roof cut for two skylights and then, which are a little covered in snow today. Um, and then we did like a foot of spray foam insulation everywhere and some of the regular insulation back over there. Um, drywall, uh, knee walls, and then this is like just a pine tongue and groove that we painted white. It wasn't done by me, but they did a really good job. And new electrical lines, so there's outlets everywhere and a dedicated line to the board. <clears throat> and some proper lighting put in. So that happened about a year, uh, just over a year ago. And uh, the skylights are really nice. They open up in the summer. I actually opened them today in December um, to get the snow off of them, which was risky. Uh, but it's really nice. Gives actually gives a little bit more headroom and a little bit more like perceived headroom. Um, so yeah, so this is the room and it's so nice to have it uh, done and everything in it. Um, I'm going to talk about the layout because uh, people are going to start typing right away about the position of the speakers and everything, but I'll get into that. There's a, a reasoning behind everything, but I'm just going to walk you through um, the uh, the gear that I use and how everything is kind of connected and uh, go through everything piece by piece. Um, and if you have any questions, you can type it in there. Um, we'll have some up close B-roll that you can take a look at. Um, yeah, and it is what it is. I do want to point out, um, and I'll mention this a couple times, that it's like the way I have things laid out like is not for one task. It's not des uh, dedicated to mixing or to mastering um, specifically, although there's I can do those things. But for me, it's about um, incur uh, basically like enabling and inspiring creativity. So everything is connected and ready to go. Um, and I just find that really important. The mix position might not be ideal. The treatment uh, isn't ideal, but the, the plants and the lighting and the way the, the gear is laid out is meant to inspire creativity when it comes to songwriting or picking a sound or experimenting. That to me is more important than um, you know the mathematics behind everything. There is some sound treatment that is... Um, there's three of these around, and then there's also some uh, over here. There's uh, some of the rock sole hidden behind a blanket in the back corners. Um, but this is not rock sole. This is like just some of that foam uh, stuff that you put on walls. I have some of that. I had some of it for my old studio. This is in an IKEA frame. This is my wife's idea. So I didn't have to frame this out. I was going to frame it, but it, it's actually just like a $20 IKEA frame. And I took the, the glass off the front and then sewed, uh, stapled this material from the material store to hide that in just so, yeah, I, I like that. I, I guess I could have went white on this, but I'm sure that would have gotten dark over time. 
Um, but the IKEA frame is uh, all my wife's idea. So this is uh, the piece de resistance. Um, this is a Rhodes 73. This is just probably the most recent uh, piece to come in the studio. Um, I am, I actually laying out the studio. I, I just had a hole here for a Rhodes because all of my friends have Rhodes and I really want a Rhodes. Um, I always wanted one and I bored my buddy's Mark II. This is a Mark I a couple years ago on my last record. And I used it for, you know, putting it through guitar pedals and stuff like that. And, and I realized I needed to have one. And they also are just a staple. They look amazing. I don't play piano, but whenever a real piano player sits down to play these, it's very inspiring. <laughs> I love, I love hearing it. Um, but it sounds really great. Um, I have this uh, LP uh, linear boost from uh, EHX, I guess. Uh, without it, I I can't really get a good signal, even going into a preamp. It's going into the LA610 after this. Um, so I find it essential for this. I don't know what other people do. This, I, I've had it recently serviced. The action's still a little bit weak. There's something you can do for about seven or 800 bucks to get it in tip top. But for now, it's just in tune and, and sounds good. Um, but piano players don't love it because it really requires uh, hitting it pretty hard. I, I don't know when or where you're watching this video, but here in Canada, currently a 73 in good condition, not missing any parts, would is close, like in a serviced one is like between $2,000 and $3,000 Canadian. If you get one that's been serviced, it's not missing anything, it's in great condition, and it even has that uh, extra felt uh, treatment done, then it's like 3,000 bucks. So I was, whereas I have some friends who paid anywhere between like 200 and 1,000 over the years, so I was really dreading the fact that for me to get a, a 73 in, in 2020 was gonna cost me um, two or 3,000 bucks. So I was really nervous about that, but um, I saw one posted on, on Craigslist for $900. I dropped everything, said, I'll be there right now. Um, and it was close by. And then he said that I was sec second in line and then he gave it to the person who was first in line. So that really sucked. But then that same day, I looked on Facebook Marketplace, which isn't as competitive, I found. And uh, this was posted in uh, Brampton, actually, where Jay's from. And um, so I drove, and it was a thousand bucks as well. And it was in better condition than the last one. The last one didn't have legs or a sustain pedal. And this is originally from, I don't know where it originally is from, but it was uh, in a big, a very popular jazz band in New York City in the 70s and 80s, I think. Somehow I made it to Canada and it's here and it's great and I love it. And I'm, so, and everything works great and it sounds really nice. And more importantly that, it looks good and it fits in this little spot here. Um, so I don't normally do guitars when we go on studio tours, but these are my guitars so I can actually say something about them. They're, this whole rack here, and Jay can, can attest to this, this whole thing here is probably worth about a hundred dollars yeah. combined, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they've also probably the rack, the rack is worth the most. But all of the the gear here is, uh, uh, you know, garnered quite a lot of plays over the years. So that's all that matters. This is a Epiphone banjo. Uh, I think Jay set this. Did you set this up? Um, I have it stuffed full of padding because I like it to be really dead, and. Uh, I, like, I think it's great. I use it, I don't use it very much anymore, but we've used it on tons of records. It probably cost me 200 bucks at the time, not even. Um, it's nice to have around. There's like a lot of cool, like little like ar arpeggiator things that you can do on records and then you do delay them and they sound more like a synth. Um, so it's fun to have around. I was at this like heritage village in the summer where they have like uh, old school, uh, one room schoolhouses and old churches and stuff. And there was this like train yard and there was a um, an actor there, like person dressed up in the old time thing, sitting on the porch of this train station, fake train station, playing a banjo. And the banjo was so dead and muffled sounding. And I was like, how did he get that sound? And so I went home and Googled how to like deaden your banjo sound. And so that's why I've taped up the drum with hockey tape, which is very Canadian, more hockey tape and Kleenex on the inside just trying to, and the strings are very, uh, well, I don't know if they're old. Did, 
No, they're probably. Did you change them, Jay? I can't. That was still like three years ago. That was still three years ago. Speak. Yeah. Anyway, some of these are very embarrassing, so I'm not going to give too much time because this is like a high school bright red Squire P base that I stripped and and stained. Um, again, this is a hunk of junk, but it plays the root notes um, like every eight bars on most of my records. And, uh, in, you know, it's been heard probably three million times in the world. So who friggin' cares? But it's a, it's a hunk of junk. And actually, most of the bass recording I do is somebody else's bass being played by somebody else. So I, it, it isn't really used very much. Uh, this is my main guitar. I couldn't even tell you who makes this. Al, Al, Almanza. Did I say that right, Jay? I don't know. It's made in Spain. That's something. Um, this is my main guitar. It used to be my main writing guitar. It is still a little bit, but I got a, a, a beat up one that I keep around the house to help me write a little bit more. Um, but I love this. I love this guitar. It sounds amazing. And uh, I've used it on countless recordings. I like a nylon string guitar, even I, although I don't necessarily play like uh, bossa nova or Brazilian music, but or Spanish music. But I, I love it, and um, it it sounds. I think it sounds really good in a folk environment, and I think it's easier to record because the the B and E on on uh, regular guitars I just find are so bright and intrusive in recordings, whereas. I find that these uh, higher strings or lower strings are just softer on the ears. And um, I, I, most people wouldn't know it. Well, the way, you, like even if you played it in a folk way, people wouldn't know. They just think it's a dead guitar. But it's definitely like part of your sound. It has part become, yeah, it has become part of my sound. Um, and yeah, I don't think I'll ever move away from it. I borrowed it from someone 10, 15 years ago. And I don't know where that person is anymore. But the second I find them, I'm going to give them a lot of money. This is a uh, this is a pretty good guitar. This is a Telecaster made in Mexico, I think. And I, I like this guitar a lot. I don't play electric at all very much. But on every record, there's always like a few little uh, ditties going through at tons of pedals. And uh, I replaced the pick guard. That's the only thing I can take credit for on this. It used to be uh, plain white, I think, or cream or something. Uh, I can't remember what this color's called, but I think it's a really pretty guitar. Um, and, uh, oh, what's all this crap on it? Who knows what that is? Yeah. It's like black dust. Anyway. Oh, it's probably from this, like, disintegrating. Anyway. Yeah, that's what it is. Um, these guitars don't get used very much. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it's. I like this guitar a lot, and it's. I think it's really pretty. And it gets the job done. I'd like to have an SG, but I just don't play guitar very much. So this is my second ever guitar. This is a Seagull, which is a Canadian made in Quebec. And a lot of Canadian uh, guys and girls who grew up wanting to be a singer-songwriter probably grew up on a Seagull or a Simon & Patrick. Um, they're like pretty iconic. Um, if, and uh, I got this in probably the late 90s, mid mid to late 90s. My second guitar was a Samick, which I stepped on in the middle of the night because I was a kid and I left it on the floor. So I, I treated this with much more respect. It's now, over the years, has, uh, like, uh, it's broken up here. It's taped over, but there's a crack there and a crack here. So it does vibrate a little bit. Um, but we've used, we, we've used this on countless recordings. And I don't really use it ever. I don't even write on it. Um, it's the resale value is probably forty dollars, but to me it's priceless. It's got this like mahogany top that is like not what do you call it? It's not coated. It's not mahogany either. Oh, it's not mahogany. Cedar. Yeah, it's probably. Cedar. Okay, sorry, cedar. Thanks, Jay, for making me look dumb in my own studio. Back and sides are mahogany. But <laughs> but what is it? Um, yeah, that's probably what I meant. What is it called when it's like got this matte finish to it? It's like soft. It's not like coated. That's what I always loved about it as a kid. You know what I mean? They have like, most guitars have that like lacquer. Like this would have like a shiny lacquer right. on it. Whereas this is just like a, a matte. Satin. Satin. Yeah, that's what it is. You're right. 
Anyway, I, I do I do like this guitar. It's pretty fun. Um, the fun fact about this, I was trying to think the last time I changed the strings, and I could guarantee you it was not within 10 years, and more likely 15 to 20. <laughs> probably 15, uh, probably 15 years to be accurate. And I love it because of that very like dull sound. Some people are probably gonna go crazy and tell me to put some elixirs on it or whatever, but. Okay, so let's move over to the rack here. Um, first of all, these little speakers, somebody asked me the other day if they are doing anything. And the reason I have these here is um, because the Rhodes is so far and even this keyboard is far away from the main monitors, I felt like when I'm trying to figure something out, I need to hear better. And if I didn't want to use headphones, um, which you don't need to do on direct input stuff. So this is like a bookshelf speaker that the speaker, the system is behind here, um, but it's just coming out of the headphone jack. So it just helps me hear the, the roads more in the Juno. So uh, this is an XLR patch bay. Um, th these go directly into the preamps. So it's just handy whenever you have a mic, um, you can pick which preamp you want to go into. I imagine I probably could do that by way of the patch bay somehow, but this I think is um, works out really well. This thing here is uh, a piece of junk and it's a, uh, uh, holds uh, just takes up space for now until I can replace it with something nice. And it also belongs to my kids. They can do whatever they want with it and pull the knobs off and and destroy it, which they do. And they shove uh, peanut butter sandwiches in here. Um, but uh, I actually got this from an old TV studio. They were throwing it out. And they told me it didn't work and I can't get that knob back on. And uh, so I was like, oh, I'll take it. And so I actually had, I liked it because it had rack ears, which I thought was pretty unique. It doesn't have XLR inputs, so it's pretty pretty pointless in here, but um, I had dreams of getting it working. And um, I had two guys, two different repair guys work on it and fail. And I put about a hundred bucks into it. And finally someone was like, don't invest money into this. It's It's garbage. So there it sits and it looks like it does something. This is an ISA-2 from Focusrite. It's a, um, a two-channel preamp. And I this was the kind of the first um, like real preamp that I got, like good quality preamp. And I would suggest to anyone who's looking at getting their first preamp to look at this specific unit. There's a lot of reasons. First of all, it's an incredible sounding preamp. I think that the preamp is so clean and silky and thick. It can get very loud if you have like ribbon mics or, or condensers, uh, or sorry, dynamic mics. It's a, it's a really great, it's a very solid unit. It has a lot of cool features like a high pass filter that you can turn on and off. Um, there's line inputs in the back, instrument inputs here. I think that uh, of all the studio tours that we've been to, like I would say 75% of the studio tours have Focusrite uh, ISA preamps, either the four channel, the eight channel, whatever, or the producer thing. Um, so I, I really like having this. The reason why, I, it's not my go-to for a single mic, but the reason why I think a lot of people should own it is because, or something like it, is because it's nice to have two preamps of the same thing for stereo purposes. So um, when I recorded a Nord in stereo, I put it through this. This uh, Juno, which I'll talk about in a second, is hardwired into the back of this, uh, into the line input. So it's always ready to go in stereo. I just have to make sure everything's lined up. Um, and oh, that's that would make sense why it wasn't working today because <laughs> I was I was <laughs> testing the this and I, these were not set equally. Anyway, it's really good. I recommend it for anyone. It's it's really nice. And it's only like 800 bucks. That's the other thing. Hop over this for a second. This is an LA610 Mark II. My friend Glenn had one and I fell in love with it and I felt like I needed to have it. And then eventually you fall out of love with it. And I think the reason being is because it's a tube amp. It's really cool. It has cool features like an optical compressor and a bit of EQ options. But then over time you realize that you know, it's like a thousand bucks or 1500 or 2000 or whatever. It depends if you buy it new or used. And the EQ is great, but not amazing. The compressor is great, but not amazing. And you start to realize maybe it's better to get something that just does one thing. Um, so I don't, for a while, it used to be my vocal thing because I like touching the compressor a little bit. 
but now I've been opting to use this instead. But um, it came back into my life recently when I got the Rhodes. And so now it's permanently set for the Rhodes, which gives it a little bit of a boost. It goes through like, I think there's 10 tubes in here. Uh, I'll have to double check that. There's a lot of tubes. Um, and maybe five, I can't remember, maybe 10 between the two. I can't remember, but it's a lot of tubes in here. So I have the roads going in here. I'm boosting um, four and a half K, which is a nice uh, area in the roads. I'm cutting um, 200, is it four and a half K? Yeah, I'm cutting 200, um, the same amount, but it, cutting it in the 200 range. And then I'm uh, being a little bit uh, aggressive with the compressor. And this is just a really great, um, preamp for, and, and the extra features for the roads, because the roads tend to be really boomy and wooly. And so I'm cutting that out at 200. And then you like that, like kind of, um, crystally attack in the four range. So I'm boosting it and then compression never hurts. Um, so it's kind of funny. Like I got this sounding like a fake MIDI roads, but it's, <laughs> it's, it, I, I, it's really cool. I like it a lot. So then after I got this, I, this came up on, on uh, Craigslist for like 500 bucks in Ottawa. And I just liked the look of it. And I, I knew I liked the UA sound. The, this is an M610, which stands for mono, meaning only one. I think there's a, a 2610 or something um, that is uh, two of these units. I think this and this is essentially the same thing, except that the EQ is a little bit more... Um, basic, which is just a 70 and 140 low cut and a mid boost or a high boost. I don't know how that works. I don't know if it's a shelf or what it is. I don't use this very much, uh, only when I need another preamp. Uh, it looks very uh, Star Wars when you do that. I like doing that, like I'm ready to take off. Um, my kids like to do that as well, and I'm sure one day it's gonna rip off, but I think it's a great item and I know they're very coveted because there's different levels of this. So it's quite old. I think it's probably like the nineties or something. Um, and I, I'm just going to hang on to it because I got a sweet deal. This is my go-to preamp and I want to buy another one. It's a 1073 from BAE. It's very basic, no filter. Um, currently it's, uh, I use it for everything for like vocals. It's like, if I'm only using one mic, I'm using this. Um, and, uh, I, I love it. Everybody loves it. I love it. I want to get another one because the power supply that it comes with can power two. So it would cost me not very much just to get another one of these. Uh, I don't need preamps at, at any one time. I'm using one preamp, but for the most part, um, but they're, they're just collectibles. I like a thousand dollar collectibles. Um, so yeah, so that's that side. Um, down here, there's a headphone amp. Uh, which is garbage, um, but whatever. And um, this, okay, so let me get these little, uh, get all its hair out of its eyes. This is the Studio Distortion Box. It's from Retro Mechanical Labs um, it, called the Electron Fuzz Custom Studio. So you might be familiar with them. They're from Portland, I believe, hopefully that's true. And um, they make a lot of cool like modular synth distortion boxes and guitar distortion boxes and they make them in beautiful wooden boxes. And he started making these studio rack mounted versions, which is two of the same fuzz box with uh, XLR inputs and outputs on the back. And there's probably less than a hundred of these in the world. I think this is in the serial numbers in the low twenties. As soon as I saw it, I had to have it. These meters don't do anything. They are, I mean, they actually do something. They move with the, the audio, but like they're in Watts. Um, and it says electronics of clear field. Like, yeah, like, I don't know what it is. Every unit has different <laughs> meters. It's just where he gets meters from like uh, flea markets or whatever. So it's very cool. You can pay extra to have backlit meters, but they are smaller. Um, the parameters on it are hurt, pain, bias. <laughs> um, it's it's really, it's re bleed. It's really cool. It's really cool. So basically you can use it as a, a single fuzz box. And the, the way you can do that is you can take your guitar, plug it in here to the input, and then you can go from the output to your amp or to more pedals, which I do a lot. In fact, over here, 
put this back before I forget where this was in. Um, I will plug a base in here so it's getting a bit of fuzz. Then it comes out here to the 1073 preamp and, and then into Pro Tools or into the Apollo. And so you can use it individually and you could use, um, if you switch it to, to high Z input uh, over here, then you can use this on its own and use this for another guitar if you want. But I also have it when you turn the high Z off, I also have it as a hardware insert in Pro Tools. And um, that's how I primarily use it. And I use it in stereo. Um, I have to actually talk to him because you're supposed to be able to link the channels, but I haven't been able to figure out how that works. So instead I just dial in the same uh, presets on both sides. And what you do is I turn, I, there's a video on our YouTube channel of, about me doing this, so you can watch that. But I turn the bleed all the way down, which basically turns off the dry, uh, the dry signal. And then you dial in the sound, which is this very lo-fi, not a, not a very uh, wide band of EQ, but a very lo-fi, gritty, fuzzy sound. Um, that sounds like it's kind of like you're listening through it, headphones like across the room or something. Um, just a really kind of like busted up sound. And then you slowly bring back in your left and right uh, dry mix. And I will put this on the mix bus. I can do it on drums and then print it, which I've done. And you can be more aggressive. But on the mix bus, specifically of electronic music or music I didn't record, a lot of stuff that's um, soft synths or like done in, in uh, Logic or whatever, in just MIDI stuff, it's nice to go through this unit as the final, uh, at the final stage. And it's incredible what it does. It gives it more gain and it just really kind of thickens up the sound. On folk music or rock music or music that has a lot of organic instruments, I sometimes I'll put it on and I'll realize it's too much. It's like taking the real world and like, putting more of the real world on it. And that's just, that's not cool. But whenever it is like electronic music and you really want those like kick drums that are fake samples, if you want them to be, be beefed up, then I love it. And you know what? Even if I never used it, I just love this unit here. Makes me feel like I work at NASA or something. <laughs> um, above it is a stereo compressor. It's a Audioscape, which is a, a, a very small operation. Um, they make lots of cool stuff. And this is based on the SSL stereo bus compressor. This is on my bus. And what is really cool about this, I was actually at a friend's a few years ago who has like one of the vintage um, SSL compressors and he let me play with it on a mix. And I finally figured out what it does. I mean, we all have like plugins that emulate that. But when I was able to just sit there and listen on monitors, and turn the knobs with my hands. I'm like, okay, I get what this thing does. I get when they say that it glues the mix together. I, I actually get that now. Um, and it was a huge um, revelation for me. And so I was in search of finding it. It was actually my first piece of outboard effects. Um, and now anytime I'm printing a mix, it has to be done uh, in, in Pro Tools, it has to be done in real time because it all it goes through this. And I find that that gives me an opportunity to slow down, listen to the mix, I turn the monitor off. And uh, this just really changed my outlook on mixes. It changed how I do things. I also will put it on the mix bus at the very beginning. And I will use that as a chance to, um, to bring my gain levels down. So it's not, if I, if I set the threshold uh, where I like it to be, I keep an eye on the meter so I know if my drums are too hot um, and that allows me to, to bring everything in line. That was something that Darren from uh, uh, Jucasa taught me. Um, but, because anyway, I really like it. It's amazing. So after I had a mix, uh, a compressor on the mix bus, I realized I love what it does to finish a track, but now I need to do that with EQ as well. I need to kind of, tighten up the low end and like put a final little uh, lacquer coating on the, the mix. So I was in search of a stereo EQ and um, one of our guys that we did a studio tour with knew I was in search of that. I was looking at the API2 channel and the IGS stuff. And then he turned me on to this. This is company is from Australia and they're called High Voltage Audio. And this is the EQ S6, which is a stereo EQ, very similar to 
I think I think it's similar to like the Mog EQ, you know, that blue one. Um, it's like very rigid uh, stepped. Um, so we have a sub frequency, which to be honest with you, I can't hear. So I don't play with it because I don't have a sub. So I don't touch it very often. Um, a 40 hertz, which is kind of cool. 160, 650, two and a half. And then there's this uh, presence filter, which feels like a shelf. And, and you can start it at two and a half all the way up to 40K, which is kind of ridiculous. But um, I imagine there's some studios that know what they're doing in the 40K range and in the sub range, but I certainly don't. But I'd like to give like a little bit of 40 boost, a little bit of cuts over here, a little bit of that two and a half range is very nice for that kind of like gritty sound. And then this like air lift is, is really nice. I don't, I do not use this aggressively. When you turn it off, it just sounds like, I don't know, it just sounds like it's off by like 2%. And then you turn it back on and you're like, ah, that's better. Like it's like somebody cleaned out your ears. Um, so it's really nice having this. So every mix will go through this and then this and then this. Um, I don't know if it's smart to do this after this, but I don't care. I like, that's exactly how I want it to be done. The Apollo 8, um, that was uh, about three or four years ago. I went, I moved from the Focusrite Sapphire and I kind of graduated to this Apollo. And um, every day I pray that it doesn't shut down because it's worth a lot of money and it just sits there. I remember we did like uh, the third studio tour or second studio tour we ever did with Mike here. Um, I asked him about the Apollo and he just said, I don't think about it. And that's what I love. I love, it's true. I totally know what he means. You put it in, you turn it on. I leave it on for days at a time and it, you don't think about it. It just sounds good. It works. Um, it's really heavy duty. Um, so yeah, I really do like the Apollo. Um, I'm not in, interested in shooting out 20 different options. It's, it's great. A couple patch bays here. Um, they're kind of set generally uh, how I need it. Um, although this is where the uh, the fuzz box will go in if I if I want to bring that in. Um, patch base. There you go. Um, before we move over to the corner, um, this here is I've call it the Juno, but as you can tell from its colors, it's not really a Juno. But it is really a Juno. It's a Roland HS60, which is uh, on the inside is all on the outside. It's all the same parameters as a Juno 60 or a Juno 106. Same. You'll notice everything looks the same except there's speakers and it's a different color. But on the inside, all of the electronics, I'm told, say Juno on it. 106. Same company, Roland. This apparently is like the living room version or the church version. I don't know what it is, but it has comes with built-in speakers, which are disabled. Um, and and uh, I got this about a year and a half ago, and it took me a year to get running. I, I Again, I had to go two different places. Um, we had to get some of the keys replaced, all the voice chips replaced. Uh, funny story, I brought it to Since When in Toronto, who are the kings of Since. And um, I said, first of all, it's out of tune. Second of all, it distorts. And third, there's a voice chip dead. And he goes, okay, well, first of all, there's a tuning knob on the back. So just put it in tune. And I felt like an idiot. It's like, second of all, the distortion is part of it. People like that. You just have to turn the volume down. And then the third was a voice chip, which they replaced. But the tuning thing, I was pretty embarrassed by. Like there on the back, it says tuning. Um, it's a great synth. I'm not a huge fan of polyphonics, or I wasn't at the time. And then I got this and I realized what all the fuss was about. The problem with this is that when you record synths in mono, it's nice because you can place them in the mix where you want to and keep the middle clear. This guy, especially when you turn on the chorus effects, which is what it's known for, it becomes so wide and it makes it really difficult to mix in other similar instruments because it just takes up the whole mix. So you either need to use this really subtly in a, in a low frequency way as a pad, or as a mono um, uh, hook, or um, just use this. May get a gorgeous sound and then don't do too much else to the mix because it's a real beast and it takes up a lot of space in the mix. But man, it's fun. It's really gorgeous. I get the appeal. All right. Oh, this 
uh, radial reamp is for taking uh, a channel in Pro Tools and sending it to properly sending it to guitar pedals and guitar amps. I bought this thinking I'm going to do that a lot. <laughs> and I don't think I've, I've used it once in a mixing application. I've fooled around with it. But again, if somebody sends me a snare that's not real or that's kind of weak, I can send it out of Pro Tools from there into a guitar pedal or into the Moog or into a guitar amp and then and then mic it back in. Um, yeah, I, so when I was thinking about the studio tour, I was like, oh, I forgot about that thing. Uh, it's the problem is, is that it's same with like any of the effects is like, you think, oh, I, I'm going to, I'm going to take a track from Pro Tools and send it out through a guitar pedal. But then when you get to mixing and you're on a deadline, it's throw like, a yeah, throw a plug in on it. It's quicker and easier. Anyway. Okay. So one of the things that I, uh, I know people have been typing in the comments um, on previous videos and on Instagram, and you're already doing now, is asking why I have the computer and the speakers in the corner of the room. People like to tell me how wrong I am, and that's fine, but there's a lot of reasons for it, and I'll try to explain some of them now, but basically, um, the way, the room is very small. As you can see, I'm standing here, and there's not a lot of headroom. It's a very small room. I don't know what it is. It's like 10 by 20 or something. Uh, 15 by 20. I don't know. It's a very small room. It looks big on Instagram. That's the point. But um, it's it's very, very small. And as, as we've shown you, there's a trap door in the middle of the room. And so there was a lot of debate when we did the renovation, uh, where are we going to put the mix desk? Can we, can we put it in the middle? The problem is if you put it in the middle, the iMac has to come out, the height of the iMac and the speakers would put the the back of the desk right here. So now you have all of this space back here that's wasted. Then the, the desk would come out to about here. And then my rolly chair would come out to about here, which would put me um, right at the edge of the trap door, which is, which is actually a huge problem because most of the time when other people aren't up here, I leave the trap door open. And so there was that concern. Plus, if you were to put it here, all of a sudden, either side of the desk uh, would be kind of useless. Um, whereas here, this desk, which is custom made, um, and I saw Jay eyeballing my custom, beautiful woodworking here of, uh, buying these from Home Depot. Um, but I did saw off the back on an angle so that this can be tucked in more and the speakers are right in there. So you might think, well, does this create a huge base cannon? There is some rock soul, um, cut and triangles back there to try to absorb some of that. The other thing is that these speakers have that uh, arc room correction on it, which I think really help. And the other thing is I often will mix very quietly because it's very quiet and private up here. I can mix and I'm sitting very close to the speakers. I can have the volume really low. So there's not a ton of buildup because of that. And finally, it's my studio. I can do whatever I want. And it was more important for me to optimize space. This isn't a uh, a control center. This isn't like a mix and mastering house. This is a place to write music, to work with musicians, to think about sounds, experiment. And so it was more important for me to have the synths and the pedals over there, the computer here with quick access to the preamps and then the roads and the guitars, and then have a nice space to record. So there is logic behind all of this. It, you may not agree with it, but uh, you can do your own studio however you want. Um, I, you tell them, Scott. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's funny. Like, people do bring it up on Instagram when I repost a picture. Um, and you would think that it's wrong, but the room is really challenging. We actually tried to get a dormer installed or have the roof lifted. But the problem is, with the trap door, and remember, this is a 150-year-old house, um, with the trap door, it means... Um, that if you were to get a, um, a change the roof line or cut into the trusses, then you would then need a permit. And when you get a permit, you have to have a proper entrance and exit. And this they would not consider to be a proper entrance and exit. So um, we talked to three different contractors to try to get a dormer installed to, or to raise the roof, um, but it can't be done without installing a proper staircase, which also can't be done because the staircase the codes, it has to be a certain width. So it would have to be wider than it is now. And there's like a steepness code. And so it would have to like end up 
all the way past there. So nothing could be done, but I'm really happy with how it turned out anyway. Um, and uh, there's my rant, over. Okay, so these are uh, KRK V6s. Whenever I first started like taking things a little bit seriously, I went to the music store and said, I need studio monitors. And the guy said to me, these are used. And they just came in today and they'll be gone today. So you better get them. And I don't know if he was BSing me to make a sale, but it worked. And so I got a, a good deal on them. And I've since seen these and the V8s in uh, a lot of cool studios that I respect. So I feel like I made a good decision. And they sound really nice. I really, really like them. Um, and it worked for me. Uh, I've got an iMac running Pro Tools with the UAD satellite. This, I want to talk about this because some people might ask about it. Um, this is called the MIC-1. I have the, the logo covered up with tape because I find it a little um, uninspiring. But um, this is a monitor controller. And um, this is volume, and then there's different inputs and outputs. There's a mute button and a mono uh, switch. I really just use it for volume, just to be able, all throughout the mix, I'm going up and down in volume, um, which really helps. I used to have like an iPod in there, but I don't really anymore. Um, does it affect the sound? I don't know. Um, the, the music's pretty crap to begin with, so it doesn't matter. Um, but it, I just use it as a volume. The mute, I used to use that a lot too, but now it's starting to get some crosstalk. So I think it needs to be looked at. Um, but it looks pretty sharp too. I actually think I might've maybe stained the edges of those cause they were like a orangey color. Um, and I want it to be a little more mogi. Anyway, there, that's that. It does look very mogi. Um, okay. So this is like probably my favorite part of the studio where I, I come up and, uh, and goof off in the evenings. Um, and I'm always trying to expand on this a little bit. Um, so this is a, a Moog uh, Sub 37, which is a, a mono synth uh, analog. And this was like my first ever synth that I got. Well, actually this was my first ever synth, but um, I really, when I got it, I was like, what am I gonna do with this thing? I don't play, I'm not into electronic music, and I, but I wanted it. And uh, I ended up realizing that it does more than just kind of those like brassy leads, that there's more of like kind of ambient drones and some more like organy sounds and some like tons of different things that you can do with it, especially through the pedals. And so, um, and it also has an audio input, so you can uh, manipulate some other sounds through the filter and the drive. Um, and I love it. I think it's a, a, a great little unit. I've used it on many different recordings, and I couldn't live without it. I'm going to be buying more of this type of crap soon. Um, this thing here is a PSS-170, if you're familiar with this. This was, I got this for $4. Um, and I then I later found another one for $4 and I bought it as a backup. Um, and uh, so this is, um, I, I actually use this on a lot of recordings. So this is right now, if, if uh, let me see if I can do this here for a second. So, so this is going through the Moog. So it's going through into the uh, the the Moog filter and different stuff. So I do use this quite a lot, and because it has kind of like cooler, more FM sounds than the Moog sometimes, and so I use it quite a bit actually. Um, this is a Volca Beats drum machine, which I used a ton on my last record, and again it it can go through the Moog too for that filter, and um, I've kind of fallen out of love with this. I, I um, I'll admit, but so I don't use it very much anymore. Sorry. Um, I, I would like to get another drum machine. I don't know what, um, but it, it, it's cute. Um, this, the purpose of this tuner, which I just pushed one of those unnecessary buttons on this stupid thing, um, is uh, the electric guitar goes into this and then I can switch between um, using this AB box whether the guitar guitar goes through all these to the amp or the Moog goes through all these. And I obviously, yeah, so it's still Moog. Um, so then it's going through these pedals. There's a more compressor. 
and uh, then the uh -huh. digital delay, which is a DD3 from Boss. Uh, I love the digital delay. I have some other different types of delays, but I like digital delay because it's more predictable. It's like it does exactly what you want it to do. Um, and if you want to just double a beat or do something with a drum machine or arpeggiator, uh, digital delay is to me is less character, more um, more of a, just a mathematical thing. This guy is really cool. This is the, let me get a little, I don't know if you'll be able to hear this, but um, this is the uh, uh, Fairfield Circuitry um, Shallow Water. And I'll do it really aggressive for a sec here. It kind of gives it that like warbly sound. Um, and it's really cool on electric. On, on um, synth, it can be really subtle. Um, and it basically just kind of gives it that um, like warbly tape sound. Um, and so I use it on an electric, I use it more aggressively, but on synth, I use it just as a little bit of modulation, just to kind of make the notes feel like they're going through like a, an a old tape or a film reel or something. It's, it's kind of cool. It goes from that into this, which is another fail, Fairfield circuitry piece. And it's a, a gated, com, um, fuzz box. I don't use this very much. Um, but when I do, it's like, it has cool things. Check this out. So you can apply this gate and you can like tell it where to open up. And then you can kind of like, it kind of crunches down on it, which okay, is really cool. Into a drum beat exactly. Awesome. Yeah. I've used, I've used it on drums. And then when you like put a delay on it, it's, it's a really cool thing. And you can kind of find that sweet spot. It's really cool. So um, I don't use it very much, but when I do use it, it's like there's no other tool that can use it. Um, and I got that from uh, Tyler from Elevator. Then it goes into the Memory Boy, which uh, again, I don't use very often, but it there's just a nice, what's cool about this is that when I first got it, I thought it was broken because well, it was really in old shape, but um, because it was so unpredictable and it was would never do the same thing twice. Um, but that's what I kind of really like about it. Um, anyway, it's cool. Sorry, I'm starting to play here on camera. Uh, this was a Christmas present. This was last year's Christmas present. This was a Christmas present two years ago. It's the Wazacraft uh, CE2 from Boss. It's a chorus pedal. It has three different chorus options. Um, and uh, it's really nice. It's stereo. That's why I wanted it. So everything is going through before the polymoon. Everything goes, it goes like this here and then here. And then this is the last piece before the polymoon. It's coming out stereo using an insert cable and then into the TRS input on this Maris polymoon, which is a stereo delay pedal. I felt like when I started goofing off with delay, I felt like I wish that I had had, I wish that I had a, um, a stereo pedal. And so I did some research and I settled on this and this is a really cool thing. It has some like unpredictable elements to it. You can cut the time in half. You can tell me how many, um, uh, instances you want. Um, it's really nice. It sounds really cool. And it's going back, it's coming back into the Apollo into two different channels, which are panned left and right. So I actually will use when I, uh, previously when I recorded the Moog, I will record two mono channels to get a stereo effect, which I still prefer to do over using the delay pedal. And the reason being is similar to what I was saying with the Juno is that if I have like say we have this, this sound on a record, I'll record it once and then I'll, and then I'll pan that to the left side. Then I'll record it again on the right side, but this time I'll maybe add a pedal to it. Um, or I will open the filter or maybe, um, add another oscillator. And then all of a sudden, when you put those two together and you pan them, it gives a stereo sound 
but while still keel, keeping the, the middle open. Whereas opposed to like adding this, it's just kind of creates this bigger washier sound, which is nice, but it can get in the way of the mix. Um, so I use this on all of the low chord stuff, but I haven't used this on more subtle instances quite yet. For that, I liked the uh, digital delay. Um, this is a stereo flange. I bought this originally for like $10 because I wanted a stereo output. And I have used this for like 80 sounds with the uh, Phase 90, which is over there. And it's fun. And like, look at that, eh? Think of like the amount of teenagers that have destroyed that over the decades. Um, this is a, a good friend. This is the Tascam 414 um, Porta Studio. I got this for $20 just to make you folks out there jealous. Um, and they're really hard to find. I don't use it very much. I did use it on the John Thumb record. I would just bounce a mix to it. Oh, I used it on my last record actually. I wrote a song, finished the song, and then when I went to do the vocals, it the song was too high for me. It was in a, a bad range. I had written it and, and didn't something, I don't know, I wasn't planning ahead and I realized I couldn't hit those high notes. So I finished the mix, I recorded it to this and then I pitched it down a little bit and then recorded it back in Pro Tools and recorded the vocals. Um, that's a song called Halfway on the record. I actually maybe pitched it up and made the song faster and then I just sang it a lower octave, I can't remember, but um, that was the last time I used it. It is really fun to record all four channels. This one works perfectly, but it's just so arduous, you know, like it's, it's fun. It's a nice idea. It's very inspiring to have here, but uh, it's just a really arduous process to have it hooked up. And then when you're recording against something on top of something that you've already played, um, you realize you have to be a good musician. You, you can't like punch yourself in or like hit re-record and try it again or do a million takes. Um, that's when things kind of get annoying, but it's really great. We did some live recordings on it with on a record we did with John Thumb. And I found sending like a really nice condenser mic into a 1073 preamp and then into this allowed for less noise as opposed to just putting a mic right into this, like a dynamic mic. Doing a higher end, higher gain mic into this was really cool. And then we took a second mic, put it on the guitar, put it through the Memory Boy and then through this. It was really fun. I have another one. This is the, I think it's the precursor to this, which is in way better condition, except that it's seized <laughs> right now. I can't get the tape out, but, um, and this is the Porta one. I got this also for $20 just to really make you hate me because I set alerts on Kijiji and Craigslist so that I know when they're, when an old granny is selling her, um, her tape deck. Um, and, uh, but it came, this comes brand new in box with the instructions and everything. And um, I need to get it serviced and then I'm going to sell it because I don't really use them very much, but they're fun. Um, this was on my last record too. I actually, um, I put a Bossa Nova through the, through this pedal and it, it on a, a, a song on my last record. The thing I hate about this thing is all the drum beats have a little bit of a bass line. So there's a key to it. So I can't really use the drum beats. Um, that one's okay. Because, uh, but there is a note in there, a little bass note that kind of annoys me. Um, the one time I did use it, I went through this pedal and then I found the tempo that was closest to the song in, in Pro Tools and then I used Beat Detective to line it all up. Um, yeah, so that's it. This is from Ikea. <laughs> uh, did, I, did I miss anything over? Oh, I do want to talk about this. This I think you might like this. So um, this is like a little Panasonic tape recorder, which I've used for demos and stuff. But I have a um, one of those car deck things, and it's coming out of the headphones. So you can send the Moog through here. And what's cool about it and I've, I have recorded this like this before, as I put a mic over top of the speaker and then I recorded this as like a dry signal with that, like a bit of a lo-fi sound, but then the, 
can hear this. Then the wet sound that goes through all the pedals comes out of another channel. And it's cool. It's just a cool to have like a, you know, a little bit different effects, but it's also nice to have to like sample the sound really quick if you don't have the preamps turned on. Um, but yeah, I love that thing. So that's all that. Um, I wanted to have, I have my classical guitar up here all the time, but I wanted to have a guitar lying around downstairs so that I could, if I felt like writing, oh man, it's coming off here so much. There's like a quarter inch of there. Um, the bridge is coming off as well. I wanted to have a, a guitar downstairs for writing just in case inspiration ever come came. And um, so this is in pretty rough shape, but I ended up just, I've been playing it. I had to replace these from Amazon and new strings. And, um, but now I've like written a whole new record on this guitar and I've really grown to love it. I love being able to put stickers on it that people give me. And it's, it's, um, I even, I even think I, bu I bought it for $50. And when I got it home, I was like, I was really mad that the guy ripped me off. Cause I'm like, this is a piece of crap. And I was like, I should have got this for $10. But now I want another one. I want to find another because it's just, it's nice to have a, a guitar line kicking around so you uh, are forced to write. Um, okay, so this is the back half of the studio. Um, and uh, that's where like the books and some of the record label stuff is like the vinyl and, and, and some tapes and all, and all that stuff. That was like a nice thing the contractor did was build the shelf into the wall, into the knee wall just to use up some of that space. Cause behind the knee wall is all just empty space. You can't really use it uh, unless you're uh, a child. And there is, I do want to mention these speakers, which work and sound beautiful. They're hooked up to an amp down there for listening to cassettes and stuff. But I got those speakers um, in the middle of the night. I was out and I saw them in a shopping cart in the, in the woods, like, <laughs> And uh, so I'm like, I'm gonna take those home. So I, I went back later and got them. And they, I had to do some wiring, but they do work and they sound gorgeous. Um, I don't think there's anything else back. Oh, there's the amps, which is a Vox. I've had this for so long. My wife surprised me with this tube amp. Uh, it's an AC15. And uh, she surprised me for my birthday one morning. It was on the dining room table when I came down. Um, and I love it. However, the amp next to it is um, a Sears amp, and I use it more. I've used it way more in recordings, and I got that for ten dollars. And it's a, a solid state. Uh, it's like it's like a giant headphone, basically. But <clears throat> I use it more because it's grittier, has more character. The Vox is just so big and boomy and loud. And if you're a bad guitar player, which I so happen to be, then it shows all of your mistakes. Whereas the Sears amp, it makes those mistakes sound intentional. So don't tell my wife that I use the $10 one more. Um, I do want to talk about this mic real quick, Jay. Um, this is on this like uh, ungodly stand. Um, but this is a warm audio U U47 tube mic. Um, and I'll tell you what, I wanted to get a good, uh, half decent mic around here. I have some pretty good mics, but, um, not nearly as many as I should have. Um, and so I got this and I thought it was like a good price, a good way to get into the, um, the U47 market. And I really love it. I, I love the way it sounds. Anytime I record a demo on it or somebody else's voice, I'm like, oh man, that's a great sounding mic. Um, so yeah, I have the label covered because I don't like logos in the studio too much because the logos are, uh, if they're, they're wacky looking, I like things to just look like, um, I don't know. I'll cut that out, <laughs> but I just, I have tape over a lot of the logos. Um, but it is a really good mic. I highly recommend it. All right. I think that's it. Thanks for coming up. <laughs>